Hello everyone, this is Matthew Bassan from train Today we will discuss about time series and forecasting. Uh, and in this video, uh, we will discuss in detail about trend analysis. Although there are many more aspects to time series and forecasting, we will limit our discussions to trend analysis in this particular video. Other details will be shared with you and discussed with you in our upcoming videos. Uh, so, um, before we get started with trend analysis, uh, let me give you a brief introduction about time series and forecasting. Right, Some basics for those people who are not aware of this concept or who are listening to this concept for the first time or probably have limited understanding about this topic. So, for those people, uh, let me move to the next slide and give you a small introduction. So, what's, what's, what's time series? Let's, let's try and put a definition time series. So time series is nothing but a set of measurements of a variable that are ordered through time, right? So one simple definition what I can give for variable, uh, time series. So, so let's take an example of any variable. A variable could be anything, right? You know, the number of passengers traveling from Bangalore Airport between 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. could be one variable, right? Or it could be uh, the temperature of Bangalore City uh, between 10 a.m. to 7 p.m., right? That could be another variable. So any 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 metric, any variable which we want to time, um, which is ordered through time, right, um, is called as a time series variable. And uh, very interestingly, if you ask me why why is it so important, why is it so important to do time series analysis? One of the objectives for time series analysis is to predict for the future, right? For that time series, how is the future value looking like? Or what is the future value going to be, right? So in many businesses, forecasting has become an integral part to plan their business, right? Especially in businesses where we are dealing with a lot of inventory, right? Inventory um, in the earlier days, you know, it used to be an asset, right? But in the modern days, inventory is straight away going into the liability column, right? So all liability side of the balance sheet. So obviously, forecasting is really important for any business um, for to plan in order to plan their operations for tomorrow, right? Um, and when I use this this word forecasting, right? You know, many times we have used these words prediction and forecasting interchangeably. Although it looks like that it's of the same meaning, but in statistics, you would have heard this term prediction. If you are aware of the concept of regression, a simple linear regression or multiple linear regression, whatever you've used. So in regression, we use this word prediction um, very frequently. Uh, what is regression, right? Uh, regression is, you know, it could be uh, modeling a relationship between two, two variables or it could be modeling a relationship with one variable and uh, another two or three set of variables. So, uh, in short, and if I have to take an example of a simple linear regression, you know, you've got a y which is regressed over an x. And um, let's take an example of um, rainfall received and the yield achieved uh, in a particular area, right? So, if, if we start collecting the data of regarding the rainfall we have received for a particular area for the last, say, 10 years, and corresponding yield what we have received for that year in that area, if we, if we fit in a regression equation, that's going to give us an equation um, which can try and predict the values what we have observed between those 10 years, right? So let's say that, you know, we have got data of rainfall between 10 centimeters to 18 centimeters. So we are in a comfort zone if we, we are trying to predict it between 10 to 18, right? That data we have witnessed and we know how the data will react or perform. But the moment you step out of that, range 10 to 18, either go less than 10 or go beyond 18 and use the same equation to predict. Um, that's quite risky to me because uh, in that data set and that analysis, we have only seen the data behavior between 10 centimeters and 18 centimeters. The moment you step out of the boundary, you know, we have not seen, we have not experienced, we have not proved whether that data is still going to follow a linear trend or it could even tip off and move to a curvilinear behavior. We haven't we haven't analyzed for it, right? So since we have not analyzed for it, using that same regression equation to predict something which is beyond 18 is going to be a risky task because we are not studying anything else. We are just taking two variables. We are taking the historical value and creating a line and fitting a line for those two variables for the regression purpose. So that 
to me it looks like a risky affair so when it comes to forecasting right time series analysis comes handy there because time series um, we just don't limit our studies just to two variables right in that variable we are we are learning on the seasonal component we are learning on the trend component we are learning on the cyclical component we are we are trying to learn many other components which makes it much more uh, believable for a value to be forecast using this methodology right so uh, in time series we use this word forecasting because we are trying to predict the future value uh, by using the past or the historical value and when it, when it comes to regression i i would stick to the prediction or it is kind of interpolation so so just wanted to give you a flavor in terms of the difference between forecasting and prediction and um and in time series again you know if it is um uh, in, as like in regression um the equation goes like this um and the variables used there in time series is zt instead of x and y what we use in in regression we call it as zt set t is z is nothing but a variable z uh, with a val carrying a value at a time point t that's how you need to read um zt that means the variable c the variable c the value of the variable c at a point in time t is denoted as zt and uh, as like in regression equation right we have an error component in the regression equation we do have an error component in the time series as well and that is denoted as at what you see here that's the instead of the error component e we use at at that's at is nothing but the error at a point in time t right so that's that's fundamentally how we will create um a time series equation um and um, and there are certain things which we can create a forecast for but certain things we cannot really have a forecast for uh one of the good um examples where we cannot really build a good forecast is of a random walk right a random walk uh, as the name implies you know if i have to take an example of a random walk it could be a stock price right um nobody can predict the value of a particular stock for tomorrow although a lot of experts do try charting exercise to to um, come up and finalize or to decide upon uh, what could be the future price of that stock um uh, that that isn't a foolproof method we can't really rely on that 100% um um the best assumption what we generally take um in a, in a stock scenario in, in probably predicting the future price of a stock is of the hypothesis that you know tomorrow's price of the stock is going to be the same price of as yesterday right so that's that's the kind of expectation you will have in uh, when it comes to stock prices and um, obviously and um, and there will be an error component attached to it which is purely random in nature right yesterday's price of the stock is equal to today's price of the stock today's price of the stock is equal to yesterday's price of the stock plus an error component and that error component is is purely random nobody knows what that error component is going to be another example or a very very funny example what we can quote is uh, the way a drunk man would walk right that's called as a random walk because we really don't know and there is no set pattern in which um uh, a, a drunk man could walk and he can step here he can step in the next step he can take uh, take two feet away right um so there is no stick pattern uh, to it so that's that's kind of random walk and if that is a process of a random walk process um it's very difficult to create a forecast but not all processes are random in nature there are processes which are not random right for example um the commodities with a fixed demand right um over or over a period of time uh, we can create beautiful forecasts for that there are multiple ways in which we can create forecasts but certainly such a process is is absolutely fit to be uh, used in a time series analysis to come up with genuine and uh, acceptable forecasts so that's that's something what we need to keep in mind there are two things one is a random walk the other set of processes can be definitely used for forecasting random walk is very difficult or probably i would say put it this way it's impossible to create a good forecast for random walk processes so how does a random walk process look like right so the equation for the random walk as i just told you price of the stock today that is zt t today 
is equal to the price of the stock yesterday plus an absolutely random error component and this error component is purely random and nobody can forecast it so if i disregard this error component for a while now so in a stock market situation in a scenario i will believe that you know yesterday's price is going to be today's price for the stock right so that's where you know i will find it a bit challenging to come up with a good forecast or a perfect forecast for a stock price because it purely follows a random process but for those other processes where we don't have this problem, we can come up with really beautiful forecasts and can be used for predicting the future values to make robust business plans. Okay. With that, uh, let me go to the next slide and give you a brief understanding of the various components of a time series. So far, we just discussed on the definition of time series. What are the different types of models we can expect? What can be forecast and what cannot be forecast? So let's focus a little more in detail um, regarding the time series and let me take you through the various different components of a time series, right? So a variable which is ordered through time, uh, uh, the measurement of a variable which is ordered through time is called as a time series model, right? So within a time series, there are four major components in uh, which you can see, right? The first component we call it as trend and it is denoted uh, as capital T. And then the second component we may find there is a cyclical component, which we call as C. The notation what we generally use is C. And then the third component is the seasonal component um, with a notation given as S. And finally, there is an I component, which we call as an irregular component, um, which is nothing but the error. In the previous equation, we did see that, you know, there is an AT component, right? Uh, the component here, this AT, that's typically nothing but the irregular component, what we see, um, right? And there are two different types of models, typically. One is an additive model, time series model, and the other one is a multiplicative time series model. So then, as the name implies, um, the forecast of the va variable values equal to the trend component plus the uh, cyclical component plus the seasonal component plus the regular components. So the, it's an addition of these four components which will give you a time series value, the, the value of the variable or the forecast, we may call it. And, um, and I is the irregular component, as I explained to you, which is um, equal to the AT in that previous equation, what we have seen. This is one type of model, what we can see. And the second type of model is a multiplicative model right where you know these four components indeed gets multiplied to come up with the final value of z or the variable value or the forecast value right so when i have to multiply all these four things and come up with the forecast it's called as a multiplicative model so this is a mathematical definition to it so more to it is um let's try and understand what are the typical differences between these two models right so um, this is a time series uh, chart. What you can see that, you know, it's the sales, uh, which is ordered through time. Uh, these are the years 2009 through 2014, right? And I've, I've plotted various different values of each, each month in between these years. And I see that there are peaks and troughs in this data, right? So uh, typically there is a cyclical pattern, what I can see, right? That cyclical pattern, it could be called as uh, seasonality or cyclical uh, component, um, which we will discuss in detail in the next slides. Let's assume that it's a seasonal component. So for the seasonal component, there is an amplitude. What do you mean by the amplitude? The difference between the peak and the trough, right? So the amplitude, the difference between the peak and the trough remains consistent over time in an additive model, right? So I see that the values are changing, but if I pretty much take the amplitude, I say that, you know, the amplitude is not change, varying too much. It's, it's, it's within a certain limit only, right? So that's kind of constant to my naked eyes. And that's what we call as an additive uh, model. But whereas in the multiplicative model, right, that peak and trough, what you see here, right, that amplitude keeps changing. As the time moves on, I see that the amplitude is getting bigger and bigger. That means the amplitude uh, or the difference between the peak and trough is not a constant. It, it, it has a multiplier effect as the name it goes, right? So that such models are called as a multiplying model, right? 
and this is an additive model so when you use an additive model all these four components gets added up to find out the forecast but whereas in a multiplicative model it's the product which comes into play so the use of these different components um, will be discussed at length in my next video when I'm going to cover a very powerful method of forecasting which is ratio to moving average method. But for this, this particular video, I would really want to stick to uh, how we are going to identify trend from a time series and how will we account for it and how will we create a forecast for it, right? So independently for a model, we are going to create a forecast for trend, cyclical component, seasonal component, and irregular component, add it up to come up with a forecast. So in this video, I'm going to restrict to this first component and the remaining components I will discuss in my upcoming videos. Uh, and, uh, and let's discuss about trend analysis. Okay. Let me move to trend. So, so the word trend, most of us uh, would be aware of this word trend. We would have used it in different uh, situations in our projects and in our life. You know, what's the trend? So when a time series exhibit a steady increase, what's a time series is a variable, right? The measurement of a variable uh, ordered through time, right? When it exhibits an increase, a constant increase or a steady decrease, uh, through time when we plot it in the next y diagram like you know you've seen that right so uh, if i'm trying to plot here if i see that if there is a constant increase or if there is a constant decrease right that's something what i called as a trend uh, when we plot all these observations against time we will see a straight line if we put a straight line that straight line will try to account for all um, or, 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 or can describe the increase and decrease in the value. So in this, um, I would like to really show you an example in the next slide, you know, how a simple trend would look like. <clears throat> um, uh, but there, there could be complex cases, like for instance, in, in, in this particular additive seasonality graph, what I've shown you, I can see that the values are increasing, but it is not in a straight line, but there is definitely a trend component to it, right? A component which was lesser in 2009 and a component which is really, really high in 2014. So there is a linear trend, right? And that's exactly what we are trying to see in a trend analysis, right? We're trying to extract that component from the time series and separately forecast it, right? So in a trend analysis, we generally use the relationship between these two variables. That's the variable of interest and the time variable. If that is a linear relationship, we use a simple linear regression technique, right? To come up with um, uh, an equation which can predict the trend component of that time series, right? But there is a catcher. Right, um, two um, two important aspects you need to understand. First is um, when it comes to regression, right? Um, when we when we model two variables and come up with a regression line and equation, the residuals in that regression equation, we take an assumption that each residuals, um, what you find uh, after fitting the model, are not correlated or not dependent on the other residuals. But in, in case of time series, what happens is that, you know, um, time series is often correlated. Yesterday's value is correlated to today's value and today's value will be correlated to tomorrow's value. So will be their residuals as well. So this, this assumption is violated when it comes to time series. So our hypothesis testing or the estimation of hypothesis testing may not be really accurate. Um, but nevertheless, we will stick to this um, method uh, for at least for this video to show you how a trend component can be extracted out of a time series using a regression analysis. So sometimes um, this method may not be the best method. There are simple descriptive methods um, which can be used like taking a simple average or a moving average which may be much more effective in creating a forecast rather than fitting a regression line. It's because of this particular challenge because it's a big violation in regression um, assumptions, okay? <clears throat> uh, and, 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 you know, as regression goes, uh, this is how the time series um, equation, linear trend, 
linear uh, trend time series equation will look like zt as i told you the variable z and the value at time t is equal to beta naught which is the intercept uh, plus the slope beta 1 into t the instance or the timestamp t plus uh, an irregular component right that is the at which we spoke about so this equation is something what we are trying to build between time and that variable when it comes to a trend analysis and strictly a linear trend it means there is a linear increase or linear decrease over time for that particular variable and when i say linear in all cases in when you take time series and if you see trend analysis um, some of the cases you may see this linear relationship but in some of the cases it could be a curvy linear relationship as as time moves on you know it, the data takes a bend right you know it curves out so you may have to use a polynomial regression or a transformation method um, to typically um, uh, generate this equation right this is this equation what i've shown you here is only for the linear so when it comes to a curvy linear relationship it could be a polynomial regression which we need to use or an expansion regression uh, we will discuss about those topics in our next videos as well but for keeping it this simple to give you the entire concept of trend we will only use the linear trend uh, analysis in this video okay so apart from the trend you know we just spoke about the trend component and you know we, we looked at the equation which can help us to create that trend component or extract that trend component from the time series the other two uh, components what we discussed was the seasonal and cyclical component as well right so this is in addition to the trend so a time series can have a trend component and then can have a seasonal component and definitely can have a cyclical component and may also have a, uh, an irregular component so we are trying to <clears throat> extract these four components and create forecasts for these individual components and then either add it or multiply it as per the model what we have seen if it's an additive model we go ahead and add it and if it's a multiplicative model we go ahead and multiply that so before we get into the technicals we need to understand a bit more in terms of what is seasonal and what is cyclical so you know what is a cycle it's 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 a pattern what we observe in a data over time right so um, in when it comes to a cyclical pattern and if the data period is within one year right or one year right that is called as a seasonal variation i will give you an example the first graph here shows that there is a seasonality here why i would say that is a seasonality because this cyclical pattern what i can see here repeats by itself um, in a yearly time period right you know it starts from jan and ends at december and then it sets start from jan again and then it ends at december and then it sets out so it, the time period in which i can see the cyclical pattern is one year or less so when it is one year or less is where we call it as a seasonal pattern right whereas if this particular pattern repeat by itself only in multiple years that means um, in five years this cycle pattern happens like for instance in this graph you can see that you know this is also kind of repeating right but this does not repeat uh, in a period of a year it, it repeats in a period of three to four years you see that you know there are peaks and troughs so gross earning annual so this there is strictly a trend component and then i see there is a cyclical component more than a seasonal component right the same holds good here as well <clears throat> right you see that you know this pattern this pattern repeats um, almost uh, every year right so this pattern repeats almost every year right um, uh, so I, I'll say that you know there is there is a seasonal component to it so this is monthly data right you're looking at monthly data and you see that you know the, the period is less than one year so there is a seasonal component attached to it so to make it very simple for you when the cyclical pattern in our data has a period of one year we call it as a seasonal pattern when the cyclical pattern is other than one year or more than one then we call it as a cyclical variation right so we've already discussed on trend component seasonal component and cyclical component obviously and the last component is i which is an irregular component which is nothing but the error 
where we won't be able to predict. It's just that, you know, we need to live with it, right? What we, a best time series analysis, what we do is that, you know, we will account for trend, we will account for seasonality, we will account for cyclical behavior, and then we create a good forecast for these three components, and we leave aside the I component uh, for random chance, right? You know, we have to live with it, you know, that's, that's the amount of risk what we take when we create a forecast and, uh, you know, we expect that irregular comp component to act and then that's the amount of variation. So we need to we need to keep that irregular component as low as possible for a higher accuracy forecasting model, right? So that's, that's um, the various four components we just spoke about. And as I told you in the beginning, we will focus only on the trend analysis in this video, right? So this um, slide is just going to talk about the trend analysis. As I told you, we have 12 years of data here, right? The timestamp and the years between 86 and 97. And this this variable is the number of readers of a particular magazine, right? When it started in 1986 and, you know, I am taking a stock at 1997, uh, how the value goes. So the first thing what I do um, whenever I get a data is, uh, and if I have to do a trend analysis is to plot the data uh, according to the time, right? And through time, the order of time, right? So I see that, you know, when I plotted this, you know, I see that there is a steady rise, right? There is a positive trend I can see. So obviously I'm convinced that there is a trend component definitely into it, right? And I see that the trend component is larger than any other components of like seasonality or cyclical behavior, which I am failing to see here, right? So if I estimate for the trend component, if I can create a good forecast for it, that itself will be enough for me to forecast the number of readers in the subsequent years. So, um, but I'm not saying that there will be no seasonal component or cyclical component. We have to analyze for it. Maybe it is good, but I'm saying that, you know, when I look at this data, this is purely a linear, simple linear trend, and I can easily do a trend analysis uh, and then see the accuracy of the model. So what I do here, as I explained to you, the example or the um, uh, line for a regression, uh, the equation for a regression analysis is equal to y is equal to beta naught, uh, which is the intercept, plus b1, which is the slope of the reader line, uh, multiplied by x plus e. Uh, that's a regression, right? And correspondingly, in in um, time series, this is the this is the equation which we will be following. Z t is equal to beta naught plus beta one t at the instant t plus an error component a t. So um, it's it's it can be easily done using an Excel sheet, right? If you can copy this data into an Excel sheet, which I have already done for you, uh, let's look into that Excel sheet. If we look into that Excel sheet. We get to see this data plotted there. So let's look into that Excel sheet here. Okay, so I've got the data put in here. So I'm plotting uh, the timestamps, you know, first year to 12th year, and number of readers 53 and 195. Trying to plot here, and I see that there is a linear trend. Now, from that equation, what I have seen in the PowerPoint, I have to estimate for first the beta one component, which is the intercept, sorry, um, the slope, and beta naught, which is the intercept. And remaining things is just a cakewalk for me because the equation goes like this, right? Zt is equal to B0 plus B1 T plus AT, right? Since I, I'm just leaving the AT component because I cannot create a forecast for it because it's purely random in nature. So I just leave the AT component aside for now. First, I will estimate for the beta naught, right, which is nothing but the intercept. And there's a simple formula available in Excel. You don't really need to do much. Uh, is equal to intercept uh, and select the X and Y. So in this case, our Y is reader and uh, X is X element is the timestamp. So if I just apply this formula and click on enter, I'm going to get this value 34.81818. That is the intercept uh, and um, beta one, which is the slope of that line, 
I just need to use this formula slope again, you know, use the X component and the Y component and then just click enter, you get, get 12.5663, which is nothing but the slope of the line, which is beta one. Now I just need to go ahead and substitute beta, the value of beta one and beta naught into this equation, right? And uh, which I have used in Excel, um, which is nothing but beta naught G4 plus um, the forecast I need is for the 13th month. So I will use 13 here and then I will use beta one. So G4 beta naught plus beta one into uh, slope into 13. Um, and I'm just ignoring my 80 as of now. Uh, that's going to give me a value of 198. So using this equation, I've already created the forecast for the 13th year and the same equation can be used to predict for the 14th year as well. You just need to replace 13 with 14 and you will get your number and that number is around 211, <coughs> right? So um, in using this equation, what are you going to account for? You're going to account for the trend component. Out of the four components, you've already accounted for the trend component and the trend component if you have to create a forecast, you just need to substitute the values of beta naught, beta one, and the timestamp to which you are planning to generate a forecast for, and that's going to create a, a number which can be used as a safe estimate um, as a trend component forecast. Okay, I hope that this video is helping you in understanding uh, what uh, I'm trying to explain of a time series and the four different components and the first component of a trend component, how that can be estimated and how an esti forecast can be created for a trend component, which we typically call as a time series analysis. Say uh, this line is fairly a good match for the original line, what you see here, right? This is the trend component line, you know, these are the trend, these are the numbers what we have got using these formula, right? These are the original numbers and this is the trend component. So the difference between this 47 and 53, right? The value of six is nothing but 80, which we cannot account for because it's purely random in nature, right? So, but here, if you see that this, this red line is quite a good nice uh, line to um, define the variable uh, very well right at a particular level of accuracy if you really look at the r square number of it it may give us an accuracy close to around 90 percent um, that means 90 percent of the variation in this variable of readers can be explained just by time and uh, we created the forecast for that as well so that's that's um, with that, you know, I'm just going back to the PowerPoint just to give you the last and the final closing note. So as I told you, this is this is the time series what we are looking at. And uh, just to explain what I have explained everything to summarize that, you know, the intercept can be used, um, calculated by the formula uh, and slope also can be calculated by using the same formula and the trend forecast for the period of 13. 14 this is how we've calculated it um, and this is uh, typically the values we have generated for 13 and 14 and as I as I told you in the previous slides this is one type of relationship which exists that's a linear simple linear uh, relationship but many a times what you may see that you know it may not be as simple as a straight line it may not be as simple as a straight line it could be a curved line Right, there could be a curved relationship, right? There could be a curved line which is fitting. Uh, so for those, you know, we use another technique called as an exponential or a quadratic model, um, which is um, which can be discussed in our um, future videos, which I will be covering in my future videos. But in case if you have got any doubts, uh, please do not hesitate to write to me at info at the rate train firm .com, I -N -F -O at the rate train firm.com i will revert to you to your queries and in case if we need a webex session we can have it um, you know i will make arrangements for that and to, for you to log into my webex my train firm webex and try and resolve your queries till then uh, i would strongly encourage you to use these techniques in your projects and get a, a good understanding and uh, wishing you all the best uh, for your um, projects uh, in terms of using trend analysis. Thank you so much for watching this video.